Coming up on today's Locked on Dimebacks podcast, we got a special treat for the viewers because it's been a long time since he's made an appearance on this pod, but it's crossover season. So we got to bring on Javier Reyes of Locked on Padres to talk about Xander Bogarts. Is this Manny Machado's final season? Will we ever see Fernando Tatis Jr. again? All on today's podcast. You are Locked on Diamondbacks. Your daily Arizona Diamondbacks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Miller Thomas, host of this wonderful podcast, I'm a multimedia journalist, and I'm a graphic designer. So please go check out my website, MillerThomas24, that my portfolio.com. On there, you can see all my latest work from my packages to my articles to my photos and my graphic design. If you want to see more content by me, just follow me on Twitter at CreatorThomas24 for my personal account, or just look up a lock on Dimebacks about Twitter, Instagram for the podcast handle, and of course, Thank you for making Locked on Dimebacks your first listen every day. I would not be able to do this podcast without you, my loyal listeners, sharing, subscribing, reviewing, doing all that so I could do this podcast for you. Thank you. It's free and available on all platforms, so please continue to tell your friends. And this episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started today. And there's not a better bet in the sports business, in the crossover business, than when you bring Javier Reyes of Locked On Padres on your podcast because you know your pod is going to do numbers when he's talking with you. So without further ado, let's bring the man on who's going to inflate our numbers for this week. Javier Reyes. <laughs> <laughs> How you doing, sir? I am doing fantastic, sir. Thank you, as always, for the very warm and lovely introduction. I love doing our crossovers, uh, and we haven't done them in a while, which is mm-hmm. which is which is Been true for sure. Um, but every time, they're always a delight. They're always a delight, and we're giving people a a jam packed, double stuffed. Um, what's a food that's double stuffed? Whatever food that's double stuffed. Bill bar. There you go. Double stuffed Bill bar. bar. Double yeah. stuff built bar. There you uh-huh. go. There, this is why they pay Miller the big bucks, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, but man, I'm thrilled to be here. I know we've had some fun over the years talking D backs, Padres. Um, and I'm excited to keep it going because I think that the D backs are a very sneaky team this year. Mm, yeah, we're talking a little bit off the air. And I want to start with the offseason hobby by first, must say, just looking ahead to the opening day schedule. It's nice for the first time since I've hosted the Lockdown Dimebacks podcast. Opening day won't be Madison Bumgarner versus San Diego Padres lineup where we make our bet the D-backs lose. And then I got to do some crazy tweet for the next week on my social account. So very glad to see that the opening schedule doesn't include D-backs versus Padres because that has killed me the last three seasons. Man, it has not just kill you. It's almost murdered you online. I mean, I've won multiple wagers against you, one of which... Multi- has it been all of them? I, oh, you know what I'm oh, thinking about? I'm thinking about like I'm thinking about like our like fantasy league that I was a part of. Which <laughs> what those I who don't know, yeah, those who don't know, I don't know how he does it. This man wins every fantasy league he's in. It's I'm actually laughing. incredible. I will never forget. Locked on, just a quick thing. Locked on fantasy football league. This man had the second lowest points. I had the second most. I missed the playoffs. He made it and he won. Like I don't know. <laughs> He does this, man. It's, nice. He's a wizard. He's a wizard. He's an absolute wizard. Yeah, when it comes to fantasy, I'm absolutely obsessed. And I don't think we've discussed spring training starts this week. We need to hit up that locked on chat and get mm-hmm. a fantasy league going. And it has to be for money. Mm-hmm. No more just putting your pride on the line. Let's put some wallets <laughs> on the table because I'm ready to put my money where my mouth is. Javi, speaking of money, a lot mm. of money was spent this off season by your San Diego Padres specifically a lot oh, yeah. of it was tied up to Xander Bogarts I don't even have his contract details on me but I know he's making 25 a year over the next 10 to 11 years and for me as a D-backs fan the D-backs were heavily linked to Xander Bogarts as well I thought 
we were potentially in the lead, either us or the Red Sox. Mike Hazen has ties to that Red Sox organization. He was there in the front office when they scouted and developed Xander Bogarts and everything. So I thought he would have been a perfect fit here as shortstop for a season or two. And then you move him over to third base, call up Jordan Lawler. Now you got the left side of your infield. Bogarts, Jordan Lawler, I would have been so happy. I grew up as a Red Sox fan. Don't tell my D-backs audience that, but I grew up as a Red Sox fan. So I think <laughs> Sandra Bogarts leave was going to hurt my heart. But I was like, if he's coming to Arizona, it's all all right. But then not only did he not sign with the D-backs, not only did he leave my childhood team, the Boston Red Sox, he went to the enemy, the San Diego Padres. Javi, I, I, I'm not liking the move. I like it for you guys because it's going to be a huge addition. But, oh, there it is. There it is. Where are we? Two minutes into the pod. Slam Diego, baby. For the ignore ignore the guy over here. Ignore this guy over here. It's it's actually pretty hilarious oh, looking back at it. He should be in the um, middle, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, um, look, with the D-backs, and that, that's one of the first things I wanted to ask you is, th- don't get me wrong, and I do want to talk, ask you also about like kind of the sneaky – little sleeper potential that we, like we said we were talking about before we started recording of this D-backs team that has while admittedly taken some hits mm-hmm. considering how bad it was like in 2021 and 2020 they've kind of they've recovered you know what i mean they've healed they've regenerated just a tad bit and you know Corbin Carroll being kind of like the big leader because of how much of a prospect pedigree he has but i'm wondering there's a lot of those teams. There's Baltimore and the D-backs are a little bit similar where these are these teams that have really exciting young players. They're slowly getting out of the the mud that they were in before, but they didn't spend money to get like that anchor for the mm-hmm. team, right? Baltimore, I know, has been getting criticized a lot. Shout out Connor Newcomb of Locked On Orioles. Go check that out. Was there, aside from Xander Bogarts, like was there a move that you really wish that the D-backs had done to just... Have that little, you know, it's not Aaron Judge necessarily. It doesn't have to be a guy like that. It doesn't even have to be a guy like Xander. But were there a couple moves where you're like, it would have been nice to just be like, all right, we're just going to get a couple extra good ball players to kind of even this out and at least make us like a fun or a more fun team than just a rebuilding one. I'm not sure. Xander Bogarts was definitely up there on that list for me just because he's someone that's still like 29, 30 years old. I think he could have fit the timeline. Can't tell Marte's like 30. So I would have really enjoyed a Xander Bogarts. Like some people wanted Dansby Swanson, the former number one pick by the D-backs who has traded Mm. that Shelby, awful Shelby Miller deal. They wanted him to come back to Arizona. I was like, no. Dansby Swanson was someone that I did not want on a long-term contract. So I was kind of happy with the D-backs if they weren't going to sign Xander Bogarts. I was kind of happy not spending money on like um, like the Michael Confortos, the Brandon Nimmos of the world. Like, yeah, it would have been cool maybe to get like, I don't know, a Mitch Hanniger who would have been a nice little outfielder power righty for the D-backs. But I like the moves that they did. Like I'm more pro just letting – giving your young guys as many opportunities as possible, seeing where their true ceiling lies, give the Corbin Carrolls of the world as many opportunities as possible. They got a whole bunch of rookies down in rotation. Let them see, uh, let, let them get opportunity as possible and then really see where the ceiling is for your young players. See what their real potential is. And then, when, and then I think you could go from there. Once you really know what you have established in your own system, then I don't mind going out there and spending money and adding to the mix you already have. Right now, I just felt like there's still too many question marks surrounding their young players in terms of how good good are they really what's your ceiling at so once we answer those questions then i'm more pro entering in some bigger name ball players to help this ball club because as it currently stands i don't think they're really ready you know of course for the aaron judges of the world but i also don't think i would have wanted them to just go out there and spend money on some veteran who would have been good like a jock peterson or a michael conforto but i'm actually more pro just keeping it internal and trying to build this thing out naturally and just working on the margins that's what they did with the evelon goria move they need Mm -hmm. a platoon third baseman to go with josh rojas it's not some big splash or anything like that but you get 90 games out of evan longoria you get the he still crushes lefties you get some over the fence power like that's the perfect kind of move you don't have to go out there and make a big splash sometimes those moves around the edges is all you would is all you need to improve your team from year to year yeah i feel that and i know that there are other teams out there that they sign guys almost just to sign guys right like yeah. baltimore brought in adam frazier that's not a t- that's not a player that's like like you're saying you know maybe we want to give Um, what's his face, Merrill Kelly, another year, right? Like, let's just focus on those type of players where there's certainly the verdict is not out of them. I think the verdict is out on a player like an Adam Frazier, right? Like, we kind of know who that is. So I I do agree. I think the D-backs were like, all right, well, at least we don't totally know what some of these players are, right? If you brought in your, you know, your old veteran, yeah, they're probably quote-unquote better, 
but the upside is tantalizing, especially for a team that's in a loaded division like the NL West. So yeah, I mean it's yeah. it's interesting. And I look, I'm not like mortified of the D backs, but they have something. This division except the Rockies, uh, are, is going to be, like, really, really good, I think. I think yeah. that this is genuinely, like, I am i don't think this is just Padres-Dodgers. I really, really don't. I, I think that even if the D-backs don't finish super strong, I think that may be a factor of being in a tough division, similar to, say, the AL East, where some teams might look a little bit worse just because Yankees, Red Sox, um, what's called Rays, Blue Jays, like that's that's pretty rough. You know what I'm saying? So that's what I, kind of my take on the NL West. Well, well, I know uh, you just did a crossover with Ben. Kind mm -hmm. of where I'm planning my flag this year is the Giants are like just such an overrated team. Like I think they'll Ooh. be a solid ball club. <laughs> I think they'll be in like the upper 70s, probably around 500, but I'm not convinced that they're better than the D-backs. And I would maybe take a bet if when I do my crossover, Ben Caspic, I might have to get a bet going. D-backs for Giants because I've looked at the side-by-side. -side. Stack up the names on paper, side-by-side, -side, rotation, lineup, whatever you want. And you're like, mm. dang, this D-backs team straight up might have more talent than this Giants roster who just lost Carlos Rodon to the New York Yankees, who whiffed on Aaron Judge and Ooh. their Carl Correa's of the world. And then who did they bring in? I like Hanager. I like him. Conforto, they're all right. But are, are those game-changing players? Are those moving needle players? I look at the FanDuel odds. The Giants are like plus 2,000 or something to win the division. The, the D-backs are like plus 4,000. Like basically, according Ooh. to FanDuel, the D-backs are like twice as worse as the Giants. I just think that's complete blasphemy because I'm not in on the Giants this year. They'll probably be solid. They'll be a good ball club, maybe near 500. But are they going to be better than the D-backs? I'm not convinced, Javi. What do you think about the Giants this year? I want to get your take. Ooh, I like that. And shout out to the, the, the FanDuel plug. That was good, too. That was <laughs> very good. Hey, man. That's plus 4,000? I would have to check. Yeah, it. It's probably not plus four thousand. <laughs> but still, I mean, it, it for me it would be like a toss up between these two, because the upside talent I think the D backs have in terms of the maybe the depth of a rotation that might be the advantage of the Giants. But also, this is a team last year that had like the worst defense in baseball. So, you know, Brand Crawford didn't get any younger. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's there's players on the team. They also lost Brandon Belt. Granted, he's always hurt, but and and Joey Bart has not turned out to be what I think people were excited about him being a few years ago. Now he's just a strikeout machine, which is really, really bad. I think he was, what was he at? 40% last year. Holy God. Loboli. Uh, so that's pretty rough. So I, I don't know, man. I don't know. And the Dalton Varsho trade helps them out maybe a little bit in the future. I, I don't know, Jim. I don't know, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Jim. Yeah. Um, speaking of fan I'm looking at it right now. Giants are plus 1,100 to win the division. D-backs are plus 4,000. So even worse than what I originally said of being double worse in terms of odds. They're like basically triple as bad as the Giants. I don't even know how to do the math there. But plus 1,100 to plus 4,000 when one team might be better than the other. I just would say the Giants probably have a higher floor while the D-backs have a higher ceiling. And hey, Javi, speaking of FanDuel, <clears throat> let me pull up our little overlay. Let me tell our listeners a little thing or two about FanDuel because the midway point of the NBA season is here. And now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sports book because new customers get a no sweat first bet up to one thousand dollars that's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win just download the FanDuel sportsbook app it's safe it's secure and super easy to use they can bet on everything from money line to point scores and threes drained plus FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with a same game parlay that's my favorite thing to do hobby because we are not in baseball season right now it's the NBA season I'm a huge Lakers fan so every game LeBron, 25 point. LeBron, five rebound. LeBron, five assists. <laughs> AD, 25 and 10. You package that all together. That's instant money in your pockets. So don't miss the chance to get your no sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to fanduel.com slash locked on. That's fanduel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more at Fanduel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. All right. Now, in the first segment, I was trying to get you to talk about Xander Bogarts, and then you just flipped it back. <laughs> like you the... Oh, okay. I just knocked something over on my desk. That's definitely going to be a big mess to clean up when we're done here because 
I just oh, no. knocked over my bowl with a whole bunch of crumbs from eating oh, pretzels. No. Here, so. That's going to be annoying to clean up when we're done here, Javi. But I want to just ask you and get your thoughts on Xander Bogarts because I gave you my thoughts on how upset I was when he signed with the Padres. But what was your feeling? Were you like, okay, we got Bogarts, but man, that, that contract, buddy, that's pretty long there. Look, when it comes to contracts, I think that it is fair to – keep in mind that the Padres historically have just never done this. So even if they don't work out, the fact that the team is trying, especially for this kind of team, not like a Yankees, not like a, you know, a Nationals or like a, you know, some of these other teams I've spent money before. The Padres have never done this. So I think by default, no matter what happens, they're going to be excited about big deals. And I think that's what happened when, you know, the Tatis extension got announced, the Udarvish thing gets announced. All that stuff I think is always really fun for them. Um, Here's the thing. I think one thing in fairness about the Xander Bogarts contract is just that if you're going to make a bet on a guy aging well, it would be a guy like Xander for like the a decade. I mean, this dude basically ever since he entered the league has been a plus bat uh, basically every year. Defense leaves a little bit to be desired, but plus bat stays healthy. And hey, if he at least can give you a couple of years of this huge 11 year deal where he's providing really great defense, this guy had a six war last year. If he has the defense, that it takes him into the upper echelon. Not just he's a star because of the consistency, but he becomes a superstar if he also is able to combine that with the defense. He doesn't have to do that every year, but if he does it for a little bit, that'd be great. And in the moment when it happened, it was I, I, I'm just like every damn time I'm like, all right, now they're gonna calm down. Every time, every time I I forgot what I was watching, and then just out of nowhere, I just get the the Jeff Passan notification. <laughs> And I just have to head downstairs to record. It was so nuts. And I genuinely didn't think they would do that, especially because of the position, especially because of the years. You know, you've been hearing all sorts of rumors about a bunch of different teams. And the Padres went out and did it, man. And, and then Peter Seidler, he's in his bag, right? You heard his comments the other day. He's saying, ah, we got the spice. We're going to go out here and win a mm. title and all this stuff. It's great. It's really great. And I think that no one should be really faulting the Padres. Obviously, it can turn out poorly. But you know what? There's a lot of other teams that contracts turn out poorly, but they did get a title out of it. So that's kind of my response on that. And again, if you're going to make a bet on someone, he has been consistent as almost as basically any player, with the exception of a, a Freddie Freeman, you know, a Mike Trout, like those type of guys. Consistency is Xander Bogarts' his name. And we probably over complain sometimes about long term contracts because again, yeah. 25 million a year, which is not a crazy amount, is getting the same amount as Dansby Swanson. I'd rather have Xander Bogarts. He's getting two million less annually than Trey Turner. Like it's just kind of the going rate for these guys. And let's say hypothetically, Manny Machado re signs with the Padres. I know we're going to talk about that in a, in a second, but let's say hypothetically, Manny Machado re signs with the Padres for the next seven years, right? Even if that second half of Xander Bogarts' contract doesn't work out, I want that core four of Tatis, Machado, Soto, and Bogarts as long as I can in their prime, whether it's three years, whether it's six years. I want that core together as long as possible, not only because the on-the-field product with those four healthy should be phenomenal, should be able offensively to make you compete for a World Series year in and year out, but also secondly, it's like, as a fan, like who cares about a decade long contract? I want to see those four together as long as possible. As a fan, I'm not going to worry about it when Xander Bogarts is 37 years old. If I'm like a 55 year old fan, like this might be the rest of my sports fandomhood. It's just watching those <laughs> four. I'm not going to worry about what Xander Bogarts looks like in year 2024 or I guess 2044. I'm just going to care about how my team looks right now. So it's like we get too caught up. It's like 11 years is such a long time. It's like I don't want to think about that in terms of my actual age and my actual reality like let's sometimes live in the moment it's like man i'm gonna have tatis machado soto and bogarts in their prime together in 20 you know mid to late 20s all four of them for maybe the next five years like that's going to be special to watch and going to give you guys a chance to compete every single season now that we're seeing with these long-term contracts too like there's more players willing to put these opt-out deals like we see with the manny machados of the world in their contract so I don't think Bogart says that in his deal, but like sometimes we talk about these long term deals and it's like, yeah, after four years, they could opt out anyway and just resign. So it's not really a long term contract like you what you might expect. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it's just, oh man, it's like I really can't emphasize enough. Even the Juan Soto deal, there was like momentum to it, you know, like for weeks. It was still like I was still wondering, like, all right, come on, the Cardinals are going to do this, right? The Dodgers are going to do this, mm -hmm. right? Like, some team out there is going to be like, all right, it's Soto, and apparently the Cardinals 
didn't want to give up Dylan Carlson. So, uh, okay. Um, and I like Dylan Carlson for the record, but it's just he's funny right. like that. That was the big, he's all right. Yeah. He's all right. That's exactly, that's exactly right. Um, and then with Bogarts, it was like, I just thought this was a team that was going to build around the edges. And I thought, you know, with everything that happens, they were going to be like, all right, well, we have Tatis, we have Manny, we have Soto, we have three. And they're like, what if we make it four? There's four horsemen of the apocalypse. That's what you need. All right. There's there's the fantastic four. We don't want no three. I mean, there's the Trinity. You've got stuff out there. But for the most part, four horsemen sounds a little bit better, I think. And I'm hoping that it comes through. And man, Petco Park. That, that opening day in Petco Park is going to be nuts. Everyone talked about Fan Fest with Bogarts. I mean, it's going to be, I mean, we saw after the deadline when the Soto trade first happened and the first game that he played, that place was going nuts and they had the grand slam from Brandon Drury, not on the team anymore. Josh Bell hit a home run too, I'm pretty sure, in that game. It was just like, uh, like they were going nuts. It was like World War Three that we won and, and it's over. Like everybody was just ecstatic and... Man, it's going to be rocking on opening day, especially if they're able to potentially, uh, you know, do stuff along the line too. Not an opening day, but mm-hmm. like, you know, down the line. I don't know if you heard mm-hmm. Jackson Merrill, top ten prospect according to Fangraphs. Oh. AJ oh. AJ Preller hasn't made a trade this off season. Oh, oh he's we got know that, that itch. Means. He's got that itch. So I'm just saying, everybody, look forward to that in the on, uh, middle of the season, probably. Yeah, because the other thing that made the Xander Bogart signing so out the blue is the fact that they were basically turning down any reports that they were linked to Carlos Correa because it was like Fernando Tatis plays shortstop, Manny Machado plays mm-hmm. third base. Where is Xander Bogart going to play unless one of those three is a DH? And now it seems like Fernando Tatis Jr. is just going to move to center field. Do you see that causing any issues within your clubhouse or just him being in the outfield? Maybe because the D-back tried to move Ketel Marte to center field for a season. And we're like, man, he runs into the wall a lot and he's always getting hurt. Maybe we should move him back to second base. In fairness, it's a good problem to have where you're like, we have so many good players. Where do we put them? But there's absolutely a lot of concern. I mean, and I talked about this with Ben on my podcast. Just a lot of different players on this Padres team are going to be playing different positions. And whether or not there's statistical stuff to back up, whether or not everyone's going to transition poorly or not so poorly. Bottom line is just it's a big, it's a lot of change up. You know what I mean? And there's a lot of teams that when you just change things so quickly, they kind of fall apart and whatnot. Or at least they get a little bit worse. It takes time. With Tatis, he's got the athleticism, obviously. Um, Air Tatis, he's got the the glove, he's got the the arm strength, all that. But like you said, with the durability, that is a concern. But I think number one is he's just going to try and prove himself. I think that he knows he messed up. This is a team that was trying to make a World Series run. Who knows what happens if he's back on that team? Gets suspended, he has the dumb motorcycle accidents, all that stuff. I think his thing is, I need to earn back the favor. If I ever want to get back to shortstop someday... Which, who knows, that might happen. I mean, I, I actually think that it, his defense was overhated. I, I, I do. I'm not saying he's a plus, but I think that there's somewhere in between uh, with Tatis. So I think that if he ever wants to get there, he has to earn his favor back. So I think he's going to be good this season. Defensively, though, I mean, I'd be lying to you if I said I, it was a lock. I don't know. Nobody knows. It's, it's genuinely like one of the big like kind of question marks surrounding not just this team, but probably any team in the NL. It's just, what's this guy going to look like in the outfield? And I don't really know.